So, in case you missed it last week, we began a new series uh, covering the prophet Elijah, and we are in uh, the end of 1 Kings and beginning of 2 Kings. Um, last week, we talked about 1 Kings 17, and I introduced you to Elijah, who, by the way, his name means Yahweh is God, okay? Elijah's name means Yahweh is God. The first part of his name is L-E-L, which is God, Elohim. The last part of his name is Yah, which is short for Yahweh. God, Yahweh, Yahweh is God. That's what his name means. Every name in Scripture has a meaning, and it's, sometimes it's really important to know that. And I believe Elijah's name is super important this morning. So Yahweh is God. Why are we talking about Elijah Elijah for four weeks? Uh, One, because I believe he's probably the most famous prophet of the Old Testament. Uh, I believe him and Moses, Moses was also a prophet. I believe they are probably the most famous prophets of the Old Testament. And the other thing is that I think that makes Elijah really significant is everything that made Elijah great was directly from God. He doesn't have like a family history of like really important people, right? I mean, Moses at one point was like with the Pharaoh, You know what I mean? Like he's got this like cool backstory. Elijah has no backstory. In fact, in scripture, it almost appears like there wasn't Elijah and then there was Elijah. And there wasn't like this wrestling match where Elijah wasn't sure how he was going to follow Jesus. I'm sorry, follow Yahweh, follow God. But at the same time, he just jumped all in right away. So everything that makes Elijah great uh, comes from God above. Okay. Last week we talked in, uh, in the first chapter, 1 Kings 17, we talked about how Elijah goes to the king of Israel named Ahab, and he goes to him and he says to him, um, because of your unfaithfulness to God, there's going to be a drought. Okay. That we know that that drought lasted three and a half years. And some crazy things happened that we talked about last week. We talked about how uh, Elijah ended up in a cave and he was fed by birds and by a brook of the stream. And then eventually he makes his way to a widow's house who's in a Gentile land, not just any Gentile land, but the Gentile land of Jezebel's father, who was the king of Sidon. And he's fed by her there and he waits. And right at the end of 17, after about three years of this, God says to Elijah, it's time, go back to Ahab. So chapter 18 begins with Elijah headed back to Ahab to tell him the news. And Elijah runs into Ahab's highest official, a man named Obadiah. Not the same Obadiah who wrote the, who wrote the book of Obadiah, it's a different one. But he runs into Obadiah and uh, Obadiah is a believer And Obadiah has been saving prophets and hiding them in caves. And Elijah runs into him and he goes, is it really you, Elijah? He goes, oh yeah, it's me. He says, go back and tell Ahab that I'm coming and we need to talk. And Ahab says, why are you sending me to die? Because Obadiah, Obadiah, I'm sorry, Obadiah, not Ahab. Obadiah knows that when he gets to Ahab, when he gets there, If Elijah doesn't show up, Obadiah's dead. There was a hit out on Elijah. And Obadiah had contact with him and didn't kill him. So Elijah shows up. But what's really important before we jump too far into 18, uh, we talk about the gods that, that the people of Israel are worshiping at this point. So the main ones are Baal and Asherah. We talked about them a little bit last week. Baal is the god of weather in the Canaanite religion. And um, Baal is considered the chief god at this point. And Asherah, who's his mother but seems to also be his mistress, uh, Asherah is the goddess of fertility. And uh, she's not only the goddess of human fertility, uh, the creation of children inside of women and things like that. She's also the goddess of fertility of the land. She makes crops grow. And so these people worship these gods, hoping that they would keep their land fertile and that they would make sure that they had enough crops to feed their family. And now Yahweh, this God of Israel, shows up and drops a drought on them. And no matter what they do, no matter how much they pray, Their gods, the gods of the Canaanite land, seem to not be able to do anything about it. They're stuck. So three years later, here's Elijah approaching King Ahab through Obadiah. And we're going to start in 1 Kings 18, starting at verse 16. It says, so Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him that he had seen Elijah. And uh, Ahab went to meet Elijah. And when he saw Elijah, he said to him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? 
I mean, Ahab, the, God, the, the king who turned away from God, the God of Israel. The drought comes, and he's not even willing to acknowledge that God did this. He sees Elijah as the problem. Somehow, unbeknownst to us, Elijah had some sort of magical powers that allowed him to put a three and a half year drought on the people. Ahab's looking at Elijah and thinking that. You're the problem. You're the troubler of Israel. I've done nothing wrong. I'm the king. And Elijah responds in verse 18, I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Listen, you think I'm the problem? You guys turned away from God. And you started following other gods that aren't even real. You're the problem. You're the problem. Then Elijah goes on to say, let's settle this now. You. Go get your 450 prophets of Baal. And while you're at it, pick up the 400 prophets of Asherah who sit at Jezebel's table. And while you're at it, Go to all the land and find the people. Meet me on Mount Carmel, which is not a place in Candyland, for the record, even though it's called Mount Carmel, okay? Meet me on Mount Carmel, which is a mountain right on the sea, on the Mediterranean Sea. Meet meet me up there because it's a high place, and in Jewish culture, high places are where you worshiped. Meet me up there and let's have a showdown and let's talk about whether or not uh, Baal is real or, or the God of Israel that we call Yahweh. Let's, let's figure out which one of them is real. So they came. I don't know why Ahab listened to him. I don't know why the king did everything that Elijah said, but he did it. And I think what he was thinking is, that's fine. You're going to look like an idiot. I'm, that's fine. Let's all get up there and you're going to look so foolish. And here's what's going to happen. The people are going to kill you because you're so foolish. So he did what he said. Now the truth is, is based on the size of Israel at the time, not every Israelite ended up on top of that mountain, but many did, okay? The truth is, is there's probably more than 450 prophets of Baal, okay? But 450 ended up on the mountain. There were probably more than 400 prophets of Asherah, but 400 ended up on the mountain. So now you got on the top of this mountain, you've got Elijah, the king, a representation of the people, a representation of the prophet of Baal, and a representation of the prophet of Asherah. And we're going to have a showdown. So in verse 21, it says, Elijah went before the people, okay? All these prophets, he dismisses all of them, and he looks right at the people, the Israelite people. And this is what he says, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. Mm. If I could be real honest with you, the first time I read, how long will you waver between two opinions, I felt like Elijah was talking to me. Do you feel that? Because we're real quick to give lip service, aren't we? That God is God and he is so powerful. Oh, God, you are my God. You are victorious, right? We just sang it. It sounds great in theory and we love that, but we spend our lives, we spend every day of our lives fighting it. We like to be in control. We like to do things our way. We like to assume that we know what God is going to do. But how long will we waver between two opinions? If God is God, connection point family, if God is God, let's serve him. If God is not the real God, let's just stop doing this. You know what I mean? Like if he's not the real God, I need to go find another job. You all need to stop showing up here on Sundays. We need to just start over with something else. But if we believe that God is really who he says he is, then why aren't we following him? 
So he asks this question to the people on the mountain. What are we doing? If God is God, let's follow him. If Baal is God, let's follow him. And one of the most damning things I have ever read. In verse 21 at the very end, this is what it said. But the people said nothing. I'm not sure our response would be much different. He looks at them and he says, which side do you choose? Which direction are you going to take? Who's in charge of your life? And the people said nothing. They were too weak to say God is God, and they were too weak to say Baal is God, so they just lived right in the middle. Pointless, useless, their worship is meaningless to whatever God they serve. And the people said nothing. It goes on to say that Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Go get two bulls for us. Okay, first of all, we know that Elijah is not the only prophet left because we read, if you read above where we're covering right now, Obadiah just saved a hundred of the Lord's prophets, right? But what he's saying is, is on this mountain, you 450 represent Baal, I represent God, just me. There's clearly more advantage for you than there is for me. Go get two bulls. They're about to not have a rap battle. They're about to not have a real fist fight. They're about to have like an offering off. Okay? That's what's coming. Two bulls. All right? This is significant. The reason it's significant is because Baal is represented by a bull. This is how they saw him, the body of a man and the head of a bull. So here's what Elijah says to them. There's a ton of you. And even to give you the fair advantage, I'm going to let you use a bull. Because Baal will hear you. You're set up for success. Whichever God brings fire is the true God. So they're going to set these bulls on an altar. And whichever God, whether Baal or Yahweh, brings fire down from the sky... That is the one true God. There's a name for this kind of offering. It's actually called an Ola. Everyone say Ola. 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 <laughs> um, Ola is a Hebrew word that means burnt offering. This is a special kind of offering that the people of Israel have been giving since they left Egypt a thousand years before this ever happens. Okay? A burnt offering is different. See, if I give a sin offering to, on an altar, the, the animal is killed on behalf of, on behalf of my sin, and the, uh, the meat is taken by the priest and it is used to feed their family, things like that. If I give a peace offering on the altar, I get to keep the meat after the offering is given and I share it with my neighbors. But a burnt offering completely belongs to God. See, with a burnt offering... You burn it till there's nothing left. No one gets any of it except for God. In fact, in their mind, the smoke that goes up to the sky from the offering, the smoke that goes off is the animal changing form into smoke, and the entire offering is rising to the God of heaven. That fire blazes day and night until there's nothing left. So what he's saying is, you set up your bull, I'll set up mine, and let's give a burnt offering and see what happens. So he let them go first. He let the prophets of Baal go first. He, he says to them, you, you, you know, there's 450 of you, why don't you guys take, get a little bit of a head start here? And they begin to, to uh, chant and dance around this bull, and they're praying to the sky, Oh, God, Baal, God of weather, would you drop fire on this bull? And nothing happens. And they begin to shout louder, and they begin to scream and to cry, Oh, God, will you drop fire on this bull? And nothing happens. And Elijah, I can just see him leaning against a stone. And what, it, what he says in Scripture 
This isn't just hyperbole. This is scripture. Okay, what he says is, uh, maybe he can't hear you. Maybe, maybe if you had 451. No, just kidding. Yeah, but, but he says, maybe he can't hear you. Maybe, uh, maybe he's asleep. Maybe, maybe he's not interested. I mean, I don't know what's going on, you guys. And they kind of hear Elijah, and they go into the next level. Oh, God, come, bring fire. They begin to slice their skin with swords and knives, and they begin to bleed out their body. Pay attention, see us. Oh, God, Baal, would you drop fire? And from morning till noon, they go at it, and nothing happens. See, with their God, they have to get his attention in order for him to listen. And they don't understand why they can't get his attention. But church, with our God, God is here. And we don't need to get his attention. He's here. He was there, the same God on Mount Carmel, who's standing next to Elijah, is the same God who is present in this room right now. And if you have given your life to Jesus, he's not only present in this room, he is present in you. The very same God. So while these random people shout and scream and try to bleed out to somehow get the attention of their gods, and and in their own culture, if we would have been somewhere else besides this mountain, they would have began to sacrifice children to try to get the attention of their God. Nothing is working. Because Baal isn't real. So now it's Elijah's turn. It's time. And if you don't know how this story ends, it's going to end exactly like you think it will. It's time. So Elijah looks at the people, and he says to them in verse 30, Come here to me. And all the people begin to gather around Elijah. And it says, Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob. To whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, your name shall be Israel. Twelve stones to represent the twelve tribes of Israel. He brought everyone around and he began to take these stones and rebuild an altar. You know, there's a moment after the people leave Egypt where there's now going to be something called a priest. And that priest is asked to wear a breastplate with 12 stones in it to represent the 12 tribes. And there's a moment a little while later where Joshua is crossing into the promised land. And he asks one member of each tribe to grab a stone to make a monument of remembrance with 12 stones. And now about 800 years later, here is Elijah. He's drawing the people near him. And he's stacking these stones to create an altar. And what he's saying to the people through his actions is, you have forgotten where we came from. You have forgotten what God has done for his people. And these 12 stones around this altar that I'm rebuilding, right? So at some point there was an altar there that was torn down to God. He's rebuilding it. And he's reminding them who they belong to. Says he arranged the wood. He cut the bull into pieces. And he laid it on the wood. And then he said to them, talking to the people, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. So now they're on the top of a mountain in the middle of a drought. Okay, He says to these people, take four large jars and go down and fill them up and bring them back up here. Well, let's pour it on top of the bull. So that means these people who have been watching him build these altars are now being asked to take jars down the mountain to the nearest brook. Because we know there's at least still water in the land, otherwise they'd they'd all be dead, right? So they're, they're dipping their jars in water and they bring them up and they dump four large jars on top of this bull. 
And when they get back and they're probably a little bit out of breath and they finish dumping all this water out, Elijah looks at him and says, do it again. So they go back down the mountain. They fill four large jars of water again and they pour it again. And now the water is now over the bull and it's down on top of the altar. And while this is happening, there are people digging this giant trench around the altar. And the giant trench, it says, is big enough to hold 24 gallons of seed. Okay? 24 gallons. That's how big this trench is around the altar. And they get up, and maybe some of the drips are starting to fall into the trench because they've got so much water on this altar. And they stop, and they're, whew, whew. That was a long trip down that mountain. And Elijah says, do it again. And i got to tell you, I'd say do it yourself. But they take these, these jars, they take them back down the mountain, they fill them up again. And after the third time, the water has filled the trench completely. All the way around. 20, that means 24 gallons of water on top of a soaked altar, on top of soaked wood, on top of a soaked bull. Four jars, three times. My math is right, that's 12 jars. So we get these 12 stones and we build an altar. And then we cover that altar with 12 jars of water. Now this water is significant because he doesn't want anyone leaving that day thinking he made the fire. Right? He, he didn't make the fire. And he's going to prove it because there's no way he can make the fire with that much water over everything. So now here they are at the top of the mountain. 12 jars. And I'm sure it got real silent as this singular man walks up to the altar. And I am so grateful to the writer of 1 Kings for quoting his prayer. This is what he says. Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God. Yahweh is God, the name Elijah. Let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Lord, let it be known today that you are everything and I am nothing. I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. I'm not just freewheeling it out here. I'm doing exactly what you've asked me to do. Answer me, Lord. Answer me. Why? Not so that I don't look foolish. Not so that they'll see how wonderful I am. So these people will know that you, Lord, are God. And that you are turning their hearts back again. Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, let it be known today that you are everything, I am nothing, and whatever happens here is because you want it to happen, not because I did it, and it's going to happen not because I want it to, not because I want credit, but because I want the people here to know that they have turned away from you and it's time to come home. How's that for an unselfish prayer? You know? Lord, it's not about me. It's not about whether I live or die. Because if you don't pull this off, God, here's the truth. If God doesn't pull this off, Elijah is dead on the top of that mountain. I promise you, they won't give him uh, hours. They won't say, maybe your God needs you to shout louder. They're not going to do any of that. They're literally just going to kill him. He's got one shot. And he doesn't even plead for his life. He pleads for the life of his people. Lord, would you draw them back to you? In verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up all the water in the trench. I can't be alone in wanting the fire of the Lord to fall right now. I mean, aren't there things in your life? I can't be alone. I refuse to believe I'm alone. Aren't there 
things in your life where you think to yourself, God, if you would just make fire fall, I would know who you are. God, if you would just fall down, you could, you could save me from whatever's happening in my life. Fire of the Lord fell, and every place there was water, there was no more water. I mean, it was a burnt offering that did not need all day and all night to get all the smoke back to God. It was a burnt offering that became his immediately. And while the, the people of, of Israel who followed Baal looked at the bull as a way to honor Baal, this was an opportunity for the God of Israel to set Baal on fire. That he dropped his fire on that bull to say, let me just remind you who is God and who is not. And in a moment, that bull was gone because the fire of the Lord fell. See, what looked like the advantage for the prophets of Baal became an opportunity for God to show who he really was. So what do you think the people did when they saw it? <laughs> That's not real. No, just kidding. This is what they said. When all the people saw, now we're not talking about the prophets, we're talking about the people. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate, flat on their face, and they cried, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Yahweh is God. Yahweh is God. Then Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. They seized them. And Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. Now that's pretty harsh. I mean, think about that. This is supposed to be the feel-good moment where we see God's love for his people. And now there's, a whole, there's like 850 people about to get murdered. Right? One, I want to remind you that we don't understand what life looks like before Jesus died on the cross. We don't understand we don't understand what, what it looked like back then. But two, and I can prove it if you need to see it, if this makes you unsettled. Smack dab in Deuteronomy, it says, if you as God's people encounter prophets who are either pulling you away from God or are pretending to be of God and they're actually lying to you, kill them. They were following the law. They were following the law. And where did they do it? Elijah took them all the way down to the Kishon River Valley so that they could see the water and they could be reminded that their God did not send it. And that's where they lost their life. Now the worship of Baal continues after this moment and that's how we know that there were more than 450 prophets of Baal because clearly not all the prophets of Baal were there that day. But the sin had to be removed from the camp and destroyed. And that's what happened. In verse 41, Elijah turns to Ahab, who I'm sure his mouth is dropped wide open. And he says to him, go, eat and drink, for there is the sound of heavy rain. It's like he could hear it off in the distance. Rain is finally coming to the land Get home. And he looks at one of his servants while they're on top of this mountain. He looks at one of his servants and he says, I want you to look out and tell me when you see a cloud. And during that time, Elijah drops to his knees and puts his head between his legs and just prays and worships God and prays for this moment that the rain is finally going to come. And, and the servant comes back and says, Elijah, there are no clouds. And he says, well, you go, you go do that again. You go do that again. And, and the servant comes back and he says, Elijah, there's no clouds. And this happens six times. Six times there's no clouds. And on the seventh time, on the seventh, there is creation. On the seventh time, the servant reported in verse 44, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. And Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and get down here. Get, get, I'm sorry, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. All it took was this little tiny symbol of God's movement. And Elijah knew it was about to get crazy. Tell Ahab he better get out of here. Now, where is, where is Elijah sending Ahab? He's sending Ahab back to his palace. He's sending him back to tell his wife, who is another non-believer, what just happened. 
But I don't want you to think that he's up there praying and checking because he doubted, because I don't believe Elijah, Elijah was doubting. Elijah, Elijah wasn't watching because he doubted God. He was watching in prayer. And he was waiting for God to move. So, just like last week, what do we learn about God? Here are some things we learn about God from this story, from this piece of history. Number one, our God is more powerful than any God that steps on the scene regardless of hype. Regardless of the hype, regardless of how many people follow, regardless of, of how cool they look or, or how many magic tricks people can do and say it's because their God taught them, our God is more powerful than any lowercase g God that is created. Don't ever lose sight of that. And what you're thinking to yourself is, why does that matter to me? I don't worship any other gods besides the God of Israel. I promise you that's not true. I promise you that we worship all kinds of things that we don't call gods, but they sure do take his place sometimes. We worship success. We worship influence and power. We worship sex. We worship money. We worship our spouse or our children. Maybe to you, it's not called worship. But whatever you elevate above God, that is your worship. Our God is bigger than anything that you put in his place. Two, he desires our obedience and devotion. He wants us to follow him and he wants us to choose him. He desires your obedience and devotion just like he desires mine. He doesn't just want us to know that he's more powerful than other gods. He wants us to follow him. He wants our obedience and devotion. And three, if he says he will do something, it will happen. If there's something in your life that you feel in the core of who you are that God has called you to or that God is going to make happen, if it is God, it will happen. The problem for us is we lack something called patience. And we lack something called consistent devotion. So we want God to move, but we don't want to be consistent, right? Well, God told, like, my favorite is when people say to me, like, I just feel like I have this call on ministry in my life. And I don't understand why God hasn't made that happen. Because I know he's called me to ministry. And then I say to them something like, so where are you right now with God? Well, he didn't give me the call to ministry, so I walked away. Or, well, we used to be close, but it's just, uh, I'm kind of following him now. It's like, you want God to move in your life and do amazing things that he's put in your bones. But we don't want to be patient and we don't want to be consistent. We don't want to have discipline. If he says it will happen, it will happen. But he's asking for our obedience and devotion. So what do we learn about us? What does this story teach us about ourselves? One, we must answer the question, who will you serve? Who will you serve? If it's the God of Israel, serve him. If it's the God of success or money, or if it's the God of sex or whatever else it is in your life that seems to have you captured, Walk away and go serve it if you're that confident. We must answer the question, who will you serve? Number two, our silence is an answer. But they were silent. <laughs> right? So who do you serve? If your answer to that is... Uh, Mm, I know it's not God. Your silence is an answer to the question because he desires our obedience and devotion. We must answer the question and your silence may be your answer. And if your silence is your answer, that's a problem. 
if you're trying to follow the God of Israel through Jesus. It's a problem. And three, in order for fire to fall, we must be all in. This is not the first time you've heard the phrase all in from this pulpit. If you want fire to fall, we must be all in. So, how do I become all in? Fair question, right? If we want fire to fall, if we want God to show up in our lives, if we want to see his power in our life, how do we make fire fall? Well, you have to be all in. Well, then how do I be all in? Teach me. Well, I think Elijah teaches us how to be all in. Number one, we need to build an altar. Now, I'm not saying a physical one. I'm not giving you a work project at home. Okay, I'm not asking you to go find some stones, wash them off real nice, and build yourself a pretty little altar and go find a bull. Okay, that's not what I'm asking. What I'm saying to you is we need to remind ourselves who he is. Remember, Elijah said, come here to the people. And he grabbed 12 stones to build an altar. Because it's time for them to be reminded of where they came from and what really matters. And we need to be reminded. We need to be reminded of who God is. But we also need to be prepared. So building an altar is reminding us of, what God, of who God is and preparing ourselves, right? If you want to be a living sacrifice on an altar for God, you have to be all his. You have to belong to him. So step one is build an altar. Then I think we need to call on the name of the Lord. Be bold. I mean, Elijah in this moment is saying, God, I know who you are and I am your servant because I've been prepared and I remember what you've done. I am your servant. My heart is ready. Now I'm praying to you, would you fall? Would you show these people? Be bold. Pray. Ask God to move in your life. And then we have to put to death what has taken God's place. We must surrender. We must surrender our future. We must surrender our relationships. We must surrender our children. We must surrender our, our bank accounts. We must surrender our future advancement at work. We must surrender our tragedy. We must surrender everything in our life to him. And put it to death. Because nothing is more important than God. And then the last step, I think, to be all in is we need to start praying for rain. I think we need to wait for God to move. And that's what Elijah did. He fell on his knees after God had already moved and he knew God was about to bring rain. And he just waited. And this is the part that we're terrible at, aren't we? We're terrible. We want to call on God and we want to see it happen right now. But the truth is, is praying for rain takes time. And if you want God to fall, if you want his power to fall, if you want to see him show up in your life, you got to prepare your hearts, ready yourself as an altar. You must uh, pray and be bold. You've got to present the things to him that need to die in order for you to be fully surrendered to him. And then you wait. And I wish that wasn't the answer. I wish the answer was then like you snap your finger and you get everything you ever wanted. But the truth is, is God is more concerned about your relationship with him than he is about giving you what you want. So the waiting is the opportunity for you to grow closer to the Lord. Pray for rain. So today as we finish up, um, I started thinking about like, what, what could I say? Or what could I do that would um, kind of bring this point home and allow us to move on to what happens next? Because something's about to happen. Because uh, Ahab makes it home to his wonderful wife, Jezebel. And he tells her, you're not going to believe what happened. 
And Jezebel says, as long as I live, I will make sure what he did to my prophets happens to him. The queen just put out a hit on Elijah. And in chapter 19, we get to see how that works out. But in this moment, he makes it home. Rain does fall. The cloud doesn't stay the size of a hand. The clouds grow and rain falls and it falls hard. And if you didn't get off that mountain in time, you're going to have a hard time getting off the mountain at all. Because the rain is falling for the first time in three and a half years and the ground is just soaking it all up and it's turning into a mess. Elijah makes it off the mountain. And we're ready to see what his encounter with the news of Jezebel means for him. And that's where we're going to finish. So, so today, as we end, I guess I just wanted to take that prayer that Elijah prayed before fire fell. And I guess I just wanted to adapt it to where we find ourselves today. So let me pray it over you. Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God and that I am your servant. May I live as an example of your faithfulness. Teach me to be bold. And may I commit to removing the things in my life that, you have, taken my, that have taken my attention away from you. Lord, I surrender my life and I will wait expectantly for you to move. Amen. So this morning as we wrap up, all day, all we've been singing about is the greatness and powerfulness of God. And that's what we're gonna continue to sing as we finish. But maybe there's an area of your life where you just need God to show up. And maybe today you just want to find your way to the altar just to say, Lord, uh, it's you and me. It's you and me. And I will learn to be all in. If that's you, I want you to know that you can come up and pray here at any time. The people of this church are your family and they will pray with you because you were never meant to do this alone. So Lord, would you take our time? Would you move us towards you? Holy Spirit, would you bring fire that we would see your power and your majesty?